it's nice to see many people show up for for responsive design. I'd also like to know how many sort of uh, web people do we have in the audience? I expect to see yeah most hands. That's excellent. Uh, so what we're talking about here, just let's switch to a browser first and make that entirely clear. Uh, here we go. Let's see if we have a connection. Yes, we do. What we're talking about is some kind of responsiveness and mainly along this dimension, you know. This is the standard gesture of, of responsive people. So see what happens when when the change uh, when the width of the page changes so to speak and and we have a number of breakpoints here in this case it sets fairly fairly high actually and this switch switches us over to a one column mobile view for example now there's a lot more to it than, than that but this is sort of where it all takes off so i'm Carl Masak i do a number of uh workshops and classes in web development. Lately it's been a lot of JavaScript. Uh, people are slowly realizing that in the world uh, JavaScript is slowly taking over and it's not always a great language but we're stuck with it so we have to learn it well and we have to make the best of it. Uh, there's also a number of frameworks building on top of JavaScript that I uh, tend to talk about. Uh, Knockout and Angular among them. I've been doing web development since, well, the later part of, of the 90s, I guess, but professionally since about 2002. And those were the days back when we uh, wished for tiger-striped HTML tables, and we arranged that with, uh, with JavaScript and sort of dreamed of the days when we would have CSS free. Uh, so you don't know how good you have it. A few things that we'll be talking about today is sort of look back a little bit at the history. Sort of we're not talking about a long history here, we're talking about back to the 90s. But a few things have happened with HTML in general. Then we'll be talking about various things that we connect with responsive. So fluid layouts, flexible images, media queries, and then a little bit about dynamic content as well. So responsive. This is the world we find ourselves in today. And, well, it, it looks as if it's all about screens. I would say that that's where it begins, and then we realize that we can do so much more to adapt to all the other needs of, uh, of viewers and, and the people coming in browsing our page. But the screens sort of definitely opened our eyes to this and, and made us talk about responsive in the first place, which is a really, really good thing. So it's about providing a, a, an optimal viewing experience for any kind of device. And uh, responsive has definitely been sort of the buzzword to, to enter into this. Uh, the website Mashable defined the year 2013 as being the year of responsible web design. Uh, so we're actually probably past the hump here. P people are still talking about responsive, but last year was it. So. Uh, in simple terms, if we were to define this in any way, uh, a responsive web design uses these media queries to figure out what resolution uh, the device uh, we're serving things on is. So that was what we're seeing when we, when we sort of adjust the width of the screen, for example. Uh, something behind the scenes is taking into account what we're, uh, what we're showing on the page. And this is what happened sort of in a... Uh, in one single graph. We used to have a more unified image here of, of all the screens. All that happens really was that we got slightly bigger screens every year. Uh, but that was manageable and, and all the web designers could do was basically adjust their standard width of the web page, saying, okay, now it's 960 pixels or something. And then an explosion happened here around 2007, let's say, with smartphones sort of dipping down to the, towards the small sizes, and suddenly people wanted to browse on their phones. We also had medium-sized screens with tablets, and then these huge things were, which people have at home with sort of media centers and, and widescreen plasma TVs and so on. And all these resolutions suddenly had to look good. Uh, 
sort of when you go to a website, it has to make adequate use of that space. When it's small, it has to sort of not bother you with too many details or be too wide, so you have to scroll. When it's big, it has to not look empty. Uh, so suddenly there were all these huge challenges, and they've been there all along, but we haven't really stumbled up upon them until now when we have this sort of zoology of different screen sizes. But let's start with history here. Uh, let's start with going back to the origins of HTML. And HTML was never really prepared to this, it's for this. It's actually amazing what we are dragging HTML through, depending on, uh, given what it was from the beginning. So in 1990, a proposal came up here from uh, a CERN physicist named Tim Berners-Lee. You might have heard of him. And he proposed a, a number of tags here for doing markup on text. And it was a really modest proposal. Now, these are tags we all know about, except for perhaps some obscure ones like deer and menu here. But the other ones are, are sort of well-known. Paragraph tags, headings, uh, some tag called address and so on. And this was simply, uh, the, the goal here was simply to help CERN researchers uh, manage their uh, academic writings, their academic articles. And one very nice thing was that you could instead of just doing references, you could have sort of live references and, and link the articles from one, from one to another and sort of make it into one single web of information. It was kind of big, but, but they didn't imagine it would ever spread outside of CERN, of course. Uh, note especially what isn't here. It's a very, very small standard. It, there's no images yet, there's no table, uh, there's no CSS. Uh, whether you want to put it in line or, or sort of in a separate file, you simply can't at this point. This is all there is. There's unstyled HTML. There, there's not even any form elements. So you, you're using your browser, but you're never sort of logging into anything or submitting a, uh, an application to something. Definitely no JavaScript. So this is five years before JavaScript and no Blink tag. So it was all in order to sort of managed this information. And the reason there was no styling was that we only need one uh, unified style if we're to talk about academic articles, right? We need sort of standard text and maybe some heading somewhere. A few lists would be nice, but that's all. And, and the big thing was actually the links, uh, sort of one-way links to, to another article or whatever. So we're forming a sort of web here. And it was a success. It, actually has found some uses outside of CERN as well since then. Uh, and people started forming a community about this. And uh, a mailing list was set up called World Wide Web Talk. Uh, and Tim Berners-Lee and a few other enthusiasts discussed how to sort of take this format further, how to do other things with it. And browsers started actually weighing in on this. One of the first browsers, uh, Mosaic, and, and uh, later other browsers that we know better, such as Netscape and uh, Internet Explorer and so on, they started actually being part of the discussion here. So as, as they were discussing how to do an image tag, for example, then Mark Andreessen, uh, at that point on Mosaic, simply showed up and said, oh, uh, we just implemented IMG. Uh, take it or leave it. You can use it already. Uh, all these sort of heavy, lofty discussions on how to get things right, let's ignore them. Let's just go with what we have and so on. So people were not very happy with that. They, they had uh, other ideas of, of sort of nicer ways to do IMG and so on. So if you've ever wondered why we ended up with this sort of slightly crafty format uh, syntax for IMG, it's all Mark Andreessen's fault. Uh, but it won simply by doing the right thing. We're talking about sometimes working code and rough consensus and so on. The working code was there, it was in the browser, and the rough consensus was basically people had a big demand for images. Once they got images, they jumped on it and sort of didn't look back and didn't think about how this should actually be implemented right. Uh, actually, so many things happened, so many additions, that a guy called Dan Col Connolly did a huge job and went through the then existing web and, and looked at all the pages and saw what people were using and sort of collected that into an, uh, a new HTML standard, which eventually became no known as HTML2. So now we're up to HTML2, 
it's sort of looking like this. It's looking uh, a bit more modern. We have a head and body suddenly, and we can put title and meta tags and, and links and so on in the head. This is feeling like what we are used to today already. Now, there are a lot of uh, tags missing, of course. Um, we get a few new structural elements as well. Uh, so pre and block quote and OL, and then this image tag, which people sort of love to hate. Uh, we also have form and input and select and option and text area, and a number of other tags for doing inline formatting. So things that we are used to nowadays. Uh, also, to, to some people's dismay, we also get italics and bold and TT here, things that really sort of more uh, belong in the uh, styling department, in the CSS department. And people want more. People say, we'd like the ability to position things. We, we'd like to make a layout or something like that. Maybe do a nice sort of uh, grouping of things, maybe a table in the middle. And remember, tables were just invented. They were quite crappy. Uh, across the different browsers, tables behaved extremely differently. So you couldn't really depend on them. Uh, and they didn't have anything else, no styles or anything. But the standards people said, no, you don't want that. You have to go back and, and realize what HTML is. HTML is not what you think it is. It's a markup for academic pub publications. And people said, no, no, it's not. Uh, we don't want that. Uh, we're not going to listen to you. Mark Andreessen gave us IMG and table, so we're just going to position things whether you like it or not. So without any CSS, without any styling formats and so on, people went ahead and made the designs they wanted. And it was horrible. Uh, those of you who are sort of long lived enough in this business to know what the spacer gif is all, all about, uh, know what I'm talking about. Otherwise, you can go and look it up. It's a one times one pixel GIF with transparent background, which you can basically bend uh, and set to a certain a width and height. And that's your sort of styling element. That's how you give things the right position within tables and so on. Uh, needless to say, that it's very hard to build a, a long lasting nice design on that. And we've sort of weaned ourselves off of that over the years. A, a couple of the first HTML layout books actually recommended this. And the articles have, uh, the authors of those books have sort of uh, done penance on, this, on their sins ever since. Uh, then we move up to HTML3. Now we're sort of gaining momentum here. We get a few more structural elements, the really important div. And here, table was out there in the wild already, but here it actually gets standardized with table headings and table rows and so on. We get a whole slew of presentational uh, elements. Uh, a few of these are now definitely out of vogue. No one is expected to use font anymore, for example. And center is this kind of uh, uh, thing that we are trying to avoid also. Uh, and the damage from image is sort of really apparent as people try to introduce applet and map and so on. There's simply no unified thought over there uh, as image already entered. The, the set of, of uh, elements. Uh, and again, let me repeat, people did everything with styling through tables, but it was kind of awful uh, because all the browsers did things slightly differently. The last browser that we had big problems with here was Netscape 4, and it died out actually after the 90s. In, in the early last uh, decade, uh, we finally got rid of Netscape 4. But here is an important addition, and, and now things start to happen to actually enable what we're talking about today with the responsive. Finally, we get the style and script elements, and they will go off and, and actually clean things up a lot in this business. Now, for some modern uh, uh, standards here, HTML4 is basically, let's call it the present. Well, HTML5 is looming up on, on the horizon, but HTML4 is what we've been living with for several years, so this is what we used to. Now we're finally completing the picture with the elements that we're used to today. So, modern web design is where we're aiming from this. Uh, so everyone has gotten used to and standardized on HTML4, but we look at this and we feel we can do better. And uh, 
there's basically a couple of parts to this. We can call one part HTML5 and uh, another part mobile web, for example. And we'll be discussing those. So HTML is growing up and people have finally realized that it's not just about marking up text. This is actually a, a full application format. So the people who uh, sort of kicking and screaming tied HTML down to, to just being about documents, they're now sort of, they're either gone or have given up and the people in charge are turning this into an application format instead. Uh, and we call it HTML5, but the focus is actually on, on this great triplet of things we have now. So HTML for markup, CSS for styling, and JavaScript because we want to give things behavior in various ways. But it's also video and audio. Now, this is the way we would have liked the IMG tag to look from the beginning. So it's very, very good. I'm not saying it's easy. Anything to do with, with video and audio immediately runs into a number of codecs and and uh, different standards and so on. Often you have to support five at a time. Uh, there's nice ways to draw things interactively with both Canvas and SVG. There's DOM integration, uh, different standards for microdata and so on. Uh, HTML's biggest challenge, I think, is that people ask, okay, great, when is this available? And the, r the reply has to be, which one of these 50-ish little things are you talking about? So we have to go to a page like HTML5, please, for example, to get an adequate picture of where we are in, uh, along the future. How many features do we have yet? You see all these green things here? It's kind of promising. And sometimes there's a caveat. This one, input placeholder, we can use already. And many of us do. It's great. Uh, sometimes there's a little warning here, use with polyfill, with JSON, and you can open this one up and read more details about it with adequate links and all that. So it's kind of nice. Uh, we need this kind of simplification that HTML5 please provides to know simply how, how far into the future are we already. Now, all the while, uh, these things are growing up as well. Uh, all the mobile phones, all the little black rectangles and virtual portals into uh, into the web world and, and people say, okay, we have to do something about this as well. Now, there has been support in this from the very beginning. Uh, the idea of a, a resource on the web, sort of, we go to a URL and behind that URL is a resource and it can have different representations. It can be shown in HTML or uh, JSON or plain text or a virtual world or something. And that's built in from day one. That was part of the day, uh, web uh, from uh, from the very start. But not everyone sort of got this information and it's kind of uh, uh, an advertisement campaign saying, okay, we want to be mobile here. We want to support the, the mobile web and have an alternative mobile site and so on. So more often than not, you're actually redirected to a different site uh, with, uh, with the special mobile version of the web. Whether you want it or not, it's especially uh, annoying because HTTP is stateless, so every time you go to that site, the server is going, oh, hello, who are you? And uh, doesn't remember you since last visit. So you often get pushed to this mobile site, whether you want or not. Um, to make things even worse, someone came up with a .mobi top, top level domain uh, to make things even more uh, sort of separated and so on. Now, there's nothing technically uh, impossible about just putting everything on the same site, just put giving everything the same address and handling the content negotiation and sort of the mobile specific things on that same web page. And that's even easier. You don't have to buy a new web address or anything. So my guess is that dot mobile will sort of historically show up as the probably the stupidest idea in the history of the web. Uh, well, I, I should reserve my judgment. There's no, now dot .guru as well, so we'll see. Uh, but it probably made someone a bunch of money just selling these dot .mobile domains, convincing companies that they need them. Just to make their own stance clear on this, the W3C has basically taken a, a stance on this, saying, uh, coining a term called one web, says one web means making as far as reasonable the same information and services available to users irrespective of the device they are using. So the idea is you, you still go to one single web page and it's all there. Uh, it's, it can present the same information in, 
in many different ways and you're not supposed to get less information just because you're uh, surfing on a, a small phone or a tablet or something. You're just supposed to get it in a different, more easily accessible form. And basically in, in the rest of this talk we'll look at techniques for achieving this, for still presenting the same thing but maybe shuffling it around a bit and making it more accessible. Now, in the meantime, the, the web developer, the, the web design world has also grown up. And one, one resource that I recommend quite a lot is a list apart, uh, which is a web sign, call it a curated blob, blog online, a list apart. With really, really high quality articles from the, the main people of, of the web design world. So here we go. And usually you get every, every month or so, you get two new articles where you can sort of think about things. And let's, let's do a search here. Responsive. What, what we mean when we say responsive. Yeah. And you see it gives not just old hits, but new hits as well. As late as this month, someone is talking about responsive. And even things that don't have responsive in the title are sort of bringing in the word somehow. Responsive design won't fix your content problem. Well, yes. And one of the old articles here it goes back to, well, about 10 years ago or so. Uh, it nails most of the things that we are talking about today with the responsive. And that's kind of refreshing. Uh, so. Uh, it actually succeeds in doing this by basing its wisdom on, on an old Chinese classic called Tao Te Ching. Uh, and it says things like, well-established hierarchies are not easily uprooted, closely held beliefs are not easily released, so ritual enthralls generation after generation. And sort of apply this to what we have been doing with screen widths and so on. Responsive has been there all, all along for everyone's taking and and it has been possible to solve, but we've been sort of stuck to the screen sizes and, and how they have looked all the time. So let's start with that problem. Let's start with the idea of, of fluid layouts. Uh, basically having the layout adapt and change. Now again, this is the, the challenge that faces us, the world that we have to uh, live with. And en anyone's screen is not 640 times 480 anymore. We have to basically be prepared to scale the the web page with those sizes. So you need to think about people browsing on, on really, really small phones down to basically wrist watches and maybe someone will uh, at some point read your uh, information or your ad on a big billboard somewhere in Piccadilly Circus or something. And these are screens with hugely different sizes and you have to take them all into account in some way and be prepared for them. The big solution today is grids. Now, we said we used to have tables to, to solve this thing, to, to make designs and make layout, and that wasn't sustainable at all. At all. Uh, then people had a long period of doing floats, trying to float everything in the right place, and that's extremely difficult as well. What people have been settling on uh, these days is grids. So we get these sort of column bars here and we get to choose how many of them we can fit on the screen. Sometimes we only have one column bar. Uh, sometimes we get two or three. On a really wide screen, we get up to 10 or 12, perhaps. Uh, and we can adapt the design to that. We can uh, look at all the things, all the components that we need to fit on the page, saying, which one is most important? Well, maybe there's some main content that we definitely want, want to fit in. Maybe there's some navigation, maybe some ads. Uh, and some other menus and so on. And we sort of fit them in bit by bit, one by one. It's all about the columns. And the reason for this is actually quite interesting as well. Uh, because you can control the width of something quite closely on the web. Uh, we have the, the tools to do that. We can set the width quite reliably on something. But we can't also set the height of something. So we need to make it sort of variable. And web designers keep coming back to this insight that if they try to nail down the height and, and give uh, a specific height for something, uh, that will come back and bite them in some way. 
uh, something that they didn't think about will overflow or will look bad. So we just keep the, the height of things open, let things flow down these columns, and, and then just decide on the columns. Uh, So fluid grids uh, is the concept of saying, OK, we get a number of columns. We get 12 columns, say. And no matter how, the, how wide the page is and so on. And we can simply compute the, the width of such a column, column simply by saying, OK, take the whole page here, uh, take the number of columns, divide, and, and get a width of one single column. That's fairly simple to do. Uh, we might need to compensate for gutters and so on. You saw in the last page here, there are thin gutters between the columns. We might need to include those in the width as well. Um, but simply with that simple action, we have a page whose columns also vary in, in width uh, with our page. We can also apply this to text. So with fluid typography, we can say, uh, OK, it, it doesn't matter which uh, which screen size people have because our, our text adapts in size to that. Uh, or we set the text to sort of 100% and, and it picks uh, a nice starting screen size for the screen. Uh, but luckily we have relative screen sizes here, like EM for example, scales according to the, the parent element's uh, font size or the current element font size. Uh, which means that we can base the entire layout on, on relative sizing. We set one size for the whole page, and then, then it adapts to that one size. So we don't have to go in and change every value everywhere. We just cha uh, change it at the root and then have it adapt. Uh, surprisingly here, px, pixels, is also a relative unit. We like to think of it as an absolute unit, sort of, oh yeah, there's pixels on the screen. That's probably it. But it's actually not. It's actually based on... Uh, on inches eventually, uh, and or, or on, on points on the screen. Uh, so pixels is not what we think it is, and therefore people have tended to prefer EM here instead. Now, you could go and make a, a grid by hand, simply by applying principles like this, picking a, a, a width and so on. People have traditionally tended to pick 960 because it divides very well with various things. So you can choose to to sort of group these columns in threes or in fours and so on, up to 12. Uh, and then you just add media queries. We'll come back to how those look. Uh, and you can selectively scale away columns. If you find that you have fewer than 960, uh, you, you just pick fewer columns. Uh, if you have find that you have a lot more space than 960, then you probably just give it a, a bit more margin at the edges. So this is the difference between fluid grids and non-fluid grids. With fluid grids, you keep all the columns and you just narrow them down or, or widen them. But you can also uh, have fixed grids and, and just keep adding and removing these columns as you go. Now, people have found this very pleasant to do and, and everyone invents their own grid system. So we're in kind of this uh, situation where people are almost more likely to create their own grid system that they are, than they are to use someone else's. So we have all these. I did a cursory search on the web for, for grid systems, and these were, were what I found, uh, just a few of them. Now, uh, only, only some of these will survive down the years. So company-backed things like Bootstrap and Gumby and Foundation and Cube, those will likely survive uh, down the years, and these other ones will be abandoned. So take heed on that. Uh, we can go into Bootstrap and, and have a look at that one. Bootstrap. Just to see what you get out of the box. Mobile first, we'll get to that. Now grid systems. Here we go. Stack to horizontal. So you get all these predefined classes. You set a, a width, for example, and it just stacks on that. Here we have a few more examples. And, and I can, let's see, I can adjust the width, and we can see what happens with those grids. Well, 
it still fits to the page, it still adapts the width here, and yeah, it's basically fit the width to, to the size of the page. But it's not just grids, it's also images, for example. And uh, images are a bit more problematic because they come in a certain size and we want to render them and uh, sometimes they fit perfectly to the page, most of the time they don't, especially when we have small uh, screens like mobiles and so on. Now, the basic trick here is simply to adapt things to the container immediately. So. Uh, this is the basic principle, just set max width to 100% to and it will sort of fill up to the container. Uh, we're not talk, talking about the height here, as you see, but modern browsers are clever about this. They will not bend your image into something very wide but not very tall. They will actually adapt the height as well. So this simple thing here will uh, simply make the, the image flow out into the container. Now, as usual, we, we miss a few older browsers here. So it doesn't work in Internet Explorer 6 and older. Um, fortunately, Internet Explorer 6 is quickly going away. Uh, I suppose you've seen IE6 Countdown, uh, which is a fascinating com campaign by Microsoft trying to get rid of the IE6 browser. Over 10 years ago, a browser was born. Its name was Internet Explorer 6. Now that we're in 2014, in an era of modern web standards, it's time to say goodbye. And the world basically has said goodbye, as you see from this graph here. Uh, there's basically China behind here uh, with a, a usage of between 20 and 30 percent. But the rest of the world combined is down to 4.4 percent. And, well, over here in Sweden, I, I don't see a number here, but it's definitely less than 1 percent. So, yeah, we're getting there. We're, we're getting ever less usage of Internet Explorer. As I've been giving these talks and courses, this number here has gone down from about six to, to this number here. So we're heading in the right direction. If you do need to, to handle Internet Explorer 6 as well, due to some internet stuff or something, uh, then there are workarounds, but you have to look them up separately. And notice that this is also nice for scaling down images. Uh, it's, it's not so nice for scaling up images because what happens when the browser tries to fill in when there are not eno enough pixels? Well, it makes everything coarser and, and, uh, and more blocky. That's not what we want. So in the end, we still, we're not really there with this technique. We might need to actually have different image sizes for different needs here. And then the trick is not loading them all because that consumes a lot of bandwidth. Uh, and by the way, this technique is not just for images. We usually talk about flexible images, but it's also things like object and video and embed. So sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes we actually need to provide these different resolutions. And at that point, it's time to look at the, the current state of the web standards and see what they actually propose. So you remember this hopeless image tag that was just sort of shoved in, in there without any prior discussion. What would it look like if we actually gave the standards people a chance? Well, it would look like something like this. Uh, still backwards compatible, we still have the IMG source, but we can also put in some attribute like a source set here. Uh, with different, uh, different sizes, uh, we provide width and height, and, uh, and give different alternatives simply to, to how we want to provide this. And uh, this is an alternative that's still under discussion. Uh, you can emulate it in some browsers. There are so-called uh, polyfills, which will use JavaScript to actually give you this feature before the, the browser has it. Uh, so we can already experiment with this one and, and have it work in most browsers today. Actually, we could also use scripting to solve this. Uh, so just by specifying these different attributes. Here we have, again, a normal IMG source and then uh, a custom data attribute here where we can basically put anything in these attributes starting with data dash in HTML5. Uh, and so we say, okay, there's, there's a full source here as well. And the JavaScript will simply come in and, and load this for us as well. And we can switch between these two images as, as needed. 
Now the trick here is again to try to reduce the bandwidth, especially on if you're on a mobile phone, you're on a slow connection of some kind, you don't want to load both of these images. You don't want to be sort of punished by loading the big image as well. Um, so you need to do some kind of, let's call it a, a platform detection or, or a screen size detection. And there are a number of ugly solutions that the trick is to get it early enough to to have it actually work. So people tend to use cookies or something to communicate the screen size. Well, that, that works, but it doesn't feel ideal in any way. Now, scalable vector graphics is kind of a winner here. If we want responsive things, if we want things that respond to different scalings, well, then we should definitely go for SVG. And you might think that SVG is something that came around uh, uh, just a few years back, but it's actually from around the, the turn of the millennium. It's just taken this long to mature and to, to find its place in browsers and so on. Uh, so I definitely recommend for any one of you who are doing interactive diagrams and so on uh, to have a look at SVG. Not only is it scalable, so it actually looks nice in any resolution, but it fits very well with HTML as well. So you have your DOM in HTML, your, your tree of nodes that you can um, manipulate, and that goes for SVG as well. It has exactly the same underlying structure that you can put events on and have listeners and and make things clickable and, and draggable and so on. I wouldn't recommend uh, typing in SVG directly. Uh, well, that, that would be very fine-tuned, but it would also take a lot of time. Uh, so what I do recommend is using these libraries that are already there to sort of wrap SVG in, in some nice JavaScript library. Here we have an example, and I like to show this as sort of an example of graceful degradation. This, believe it or not, started its lifetime as a table. If we go in and look at the at the source of this immediately, view page source, here you see the table. These are the numbers that went into this pie chart, and the table was simply hidden away when we realized that, hey, we have JavaScript and all that's needed to show the SVG. So by the end of this page, uh, let's see. Oh, it's over here in pi.js. Here's the sort of entire code to, to dry, draw the pie chart. And here we say with simple JavaScript, table hide, and then just show the pie chart. So what you see here is kind of a, a very fancy table where you can interactively uh, look at the different inputs and so on. Kind of a nice thing to know that we, we are at the point where we can do these graphs uh, simply and easily. Now if you want a full data format, something like jQuery for, uh, for SVG, you should have a look at D3 and show some examples here. Uh, basically the same idea as with jQuery, so you do selections over things, but this time the focus in more is more on data binding. Uh, so let's do a chord diagram. And this one and this one. And Les Miserables. There we go. So you can simply and easily plot things and have things be a little bit interactive here as well. This one is a big data set just showing how things hang together. And again, I should point out that you get most of these things for free. So you just specify all the different species that you have here and then their relations. And you can highlight each one and see their actual connections to other things. Very nice. Imagine doing this for, for example, an, a software architecture and see how all your pieces hang together and get some overview of it. Uh, here's another kind of structural view. And S, uh, D3 so takes care of, of all the sort of posi positioning of things. SVG takes care of, sort of rendering everything and, and showing text and stuff. Uh, this is also a small example just an interactive graph. So you have all the animations in there and events and you can make things uh, interactive and clickable. Here you can basically change what we are keeping fixed in this model, what we are looking at. Kind of nice. This is also a famous data set, a, a graph over all the characters in Les Miserables, the novel and how they interact with each other across the story. So this line that you see here is the main character, interacts with many people, and we can also 
recluster them and have them appear in a different order. Now again, D3 is responsible for just creating the transitions for us. So there's a lot of logic there that we don't have to, to worry about. By frequency, well, then we should get the main character up here, right? Yeah. And the different colors are sort of the different groups of people in the book. So D3 is very nice. It's kind of a different model to get into. Uh, if you felt that J jQuery was very nice and intuitive, well, D3 is one step from that. It's sort of almost nice and intuitive. Once you get the hang of it, it's very, very powerful. There's also Canvas, uh, but Canvas is not abiding to the same uh, rules about scalability and, and uh, uh, resolution independence. Uh, we, you can do a lot of nice things with Canvas as well. If you're in the HTML5 games industry and so on, you will have heard of Canvas already. Uh, I can show just one example of sort of a prepackaged library that uses Canvas and a number of other HTML5 goodies to do things. Uh, it's called ImpactJS. And here you see the kind of platforms it supports on the browser. This is a, an example game that has been implemented in it. And um, yeah, it's really versatile. You basically program this game with a, a graphical editor and, and do everything inside of the canvas like this. Here you see flexible level editor for anything 2D. Uh, so Impact is kind of a, a two-dimensional physics engine that takes care of all the objects you have on, on screen, saying, OK, this one abides to gravity, this one collides with walls. When two of these collides, then this happens, and so on. So you get this whole framework uh, built for you uh, for how to do that. Let's just see this game in, in action as well. So the canvas is here already. Um, it's kind of an evolving standard still. But it definitely works. Yeah. So now you see. It's kind of nice. So uh, and and the performance is is really nice. JavaScript has made great strides in in this area in the past few years. You can now write really performant things. It's it's no longer the the language it was with uh, bad p performance and and uh, bottlenecks and so on. It basically comes down to sort of uh, machine performance now. It's, it's very close to running on the actual metha me metal with all these Git engines and so on. And people are doing nice things with graphics as well. And if you need to compute a lot of things in parallel, uh, people are working on that too. And there's uh, ECMAScript Next, which will make things even better. And ASM.js very basically can compile other languages down to a very fast subset of JavaScript. Now, media queries form a large part of what we're doing here with adapting to the different sizes. Uh, and the first big question that comes up is, where should we start? If we now have these different sizes of things, should we start at the desktop and sort of work ourselves down and try to remove things for mobile? Or should we start at the mobile uh, side and try to add things afterwards? Now, it turns out that it, it makes a lot more sense to uh, to scale things up, to add things. Uh, people who make laws know this. It's nice to, uh, it's easy to add a law, but it's very uh, difficult to remove it or, or change it afterwards. So the same things ha happen here with design, which is sort of start small, figure out what is the bare minimum to, to display on a small display, and then sort of heave a sigh of relief when we, when we scale up and realize that we get more and more space to put things. Uh, and, and that's basically how we uh, how we design these things at this point. Some people also claim that it's never been about sizes. It's always been about sort of finding the elements that belong together on your page and designing sort of atoms, molecules, and then complete uh, organisms on your page and sort of grouping these together and, and making that look okay on, on all sizes. So let's let's take another example of these with scalable things. Let's go to Smashing Magazine, who are talking about uh, web development all day and, and uh, responsive and so on, and who have made redesigns to make this work. Oh, I was a little bit too fast there. Let's see how they actually scale in and out of these things. So 
I think this is as far as wide as I can make it. Let's try to make it a little wider. There we go. So there's actually a third thing over here where they have a bit of ads and, and extra content. And if you make things less wide than that, well, at some point it disappears and you only have two main columns. You have this uh, navigation thing over here and then the main column over here and then you narrow things down even more. And well, we're down to one single column of content here, sort of only the, the most important things. Now, they've talked, uh, thought a lot about this in, in their design. And one thing they didn't do was to look at different devices and think about phones or iPads and so on. They just said, OK, we had a number of natural breakpoints in our design. And we just, we just put things there as, as was uh, natural to us for this design. So here, at some point, there is a, a natural breakpoint that we can do. And there's this other company saying, oh, how we laughed when we realized our mistake. Sort of always starting desk desktop down. Now, if you belong to this old world of, of always doing desktop uh, websites, well, that makes a lot of sense. And that's part of this tradition that we have a, a big problem to shake. But I would actually re recommend either doing mobile up or doing sort of not thinking about screen sizes at all, just designing your page to work with all kinds of widths. But it does make sense to, to have a look at these narrow screens first and, and figure out what we can do with them. Uh, because if we do that, instead of feeling very, very constrained as we go down, we feel very, very liberated as we go up and out. And it's actually not just about width either. Uh, some pages actually uh, are responsive to the browser uh, window height as well. Sort of try to make things fit worse or better depending on the height. That's also important sometimes. Uh, and we have a few things to help us here. Uh, one very coarse grained thing is that we've, for a long time, we've been able to specify the kind of media that we support in our style sheets. And that's extremely useful and it works across all browsers. And very well tested. But the, the trick we can also use is to put these media blocks inside of the CSS. So we can say, for example, here is a section of the CSS that works for screens. Here is another section that works for print, and so on. Now, this is the part that has been extended lately and now also supports different sizes, saying it's both a screen and it has at least uh, 1,024 pixels available. And this is where we can start inserting these breakpoints and actually design uh, different optimal layouts for different widths. This is what Smashing Magazine does, for example. So it all comes down to breakpoints. Now, you might think of this as, as just um, points between different device sizes, like you go from iPad to, uh, to uh, a phone-sized screen, for example. But it's a bit more adapted than that. It's a, a bit more adapted to your particular needs of, of the web page. And you can think of major breakpoints where you actually reshuffle the entire design. And you can also think about minor breakpoints where you sort of have a small uh, bit of more amount. That you can just add a single more element, but it doesn't uh, change the entire design around, things like that. So. Mobile first has a nice consequence here and, and something that's been long in the coming. Websites have tended to become very, very heavy and complex and difficult. We see this when we see the footprint of a, of a site, see how much JavaScript and, and CSS and other resources it downloads. Uh, so the typical web page sort of weight tends to be several megabytes and that's not viable on a slow connection. So mobile first, uh, nicely enough, teaches us to to go easy with the resources, not just because of the small screen sizes, but also because of the uh, the crappy bandwidth sometimes. So it's it's not really about removing features; it's about focusing on what needs to be there, and and then trying to build across that. Um, so what's what's the important part of our page? How can we promote the actual content of the thing? How can we get the other parts in in a, a natural uh, manner? How wide do we have to be to actually uh, have place for this. So 
when you know that the client has a really small screen, you, you sort of you can't mess, mess around with all these details. You have to do really clear, smallish icons. You have to focus on a small set of, of font sizes and a small set of uh, elements on the page, and you just make it easy for, for everyone. Uh, I've known a fair number of web users who simply prefer the mobile site at any point because it's nicer to look at. It's less uh, crafty. Finally, there's a bit, a couple of points we can make about dynamic content. Now, this, the default here is simply to load everything up front, right? Uh, so in general, it, it makes sense to try to reduce the number of web requests and responses that we need to do. Uh, and as we get more resources, and, and we tend to do because we like to divide things, we have things in separate JavaScript files and separate CSS files and so on, unless we clump them together sort of in a, in a pre-processing step, that is going to be heavy for the user simply because it does request response, request response all the time with a uh, server and client. Uh, there's a bit of a fix to that in HTTP2, which is not widely adopted yet. Uh, so it will be years until we actually see the benefits of that. But that's basically making one request and then having the server come back with all the responses at the same time. That will be kind of nice. Um, there's also lazy loading, and we can do a lot here. Uh, and there's been talk about this with, with images. So why do we have to load everything up front just to show the page? S with some things we can wait. Uh, so I bet you've seen this on, on some articles, an image that shows up basically as you scroll down the page. And well, that, that technique requires JavaScript to actually work, but it is uh, easier on the eye and, and easier on the bandwidth. Um, it makes the page uh, in, in other respects really responsive and then you take the image as you need it. Uh, now another nice, nice benefit with this is that you may never need that image. Maybe the, the reader wasn't that interested, so they just skipped to the next article and so on, and then you saved one extra loading of, of that particular image. So that's kind of nice as well. We also have selective content loading. So uh, based on scrolling, for example, we can load and replace content after the page is loaded. So this is a bit wider than images. We can do this with any kind of content. And actually, it's a nice principle for, uh, for progressive enhancement in general. You can take any bit of content and, and sort of transform it like we did with the ta table to the pie chart. Or you can take a, a simple address form or something like that and transform it to an actual map where people can click around. Um, or you can make something even more interactive. So you can have the address form on one page, and then you do a 3D transition or something and, and flip around to a map that people can also click between. And all this is sort of between the different capabilities of a browser. So now you're not just scaling up uh, from small screens to wide screens. You're also scaling up from fairly incapable devices to capable devices. And this is a, a balance that will need to be struck in the coming years. We are really, really tied to JavaScript at this point, but not everyone has JavaScript or not everyone has it in all contexts and so on. So we still need to provide a good experience for, for people who don't have so much JavaScript or don't have all the different features uh, uh, for modern browsers and so on. So we need to think about that and sort of design our page, not just the smallest screen first, but sort of simplest features first, make it work um, as a bare page with just the HTML and just the CSS, and then sort of add the JavaScript on top of that. Now, the reason that is hard is that people tend to reach nowadays for uh, quite fancy JavaScript frameworks, like Knockout and Angular and so on, which basically don't give you anything. They don't work at all without the JavaScript. So uh, it's still an open question whether people will um, tend towards just supposing that JavaScript is there, or, or just try to th make things work without as well. It's especially clear, actually, if you search for things like ng repeat in the Angular documentation. Yeah, I got exactly the kind of hit I wanted. So imagine you're a website that's driven completely by one of these JavaScript frameworks. One of the big problems will be search engine optimization, because all your content is sort of behind this 
wall of JavaScript. It's provided by a JavaScript application. So they have to find some sort of solution for this. So what the Angular documentation does here, for example, it takes you to a slightly less dynamic page here. Uh, it says escaped fragment here. And if we remove this bit, well, then it takes you to the real page. So there's sort of one uh, dead page behind here, and this is the active or live page where you can actually get all the styling and all the interactivity and so on. But this page here is really hard for uh, for uh, search engines to notice simply because it's, it's a bit too dynamic. So this is kind of a um, balance that needs to be struck between should we have JavaScript or shouldn't we have JavaScript? In the meantime, search engines are getting better at this as well and, and this sort of negotiation all the time between how should we present this and how should we actually end up in our search engines. So just to summarize here, we have fluid grids to allow us to do an entire layout uh, fluidly and depending on, on the width. So with the fluid grid, we, we scale up and down with the size and we are able to manage that. Um, flexible images uh, takes the same lesson that we want to sometimes show our images with small widths and sometimes with large widths. Ma basically makes the image follow up and down uh, relatively. Sometimes we need to load in larger images and then there are various hacks for that. Uh, media queries come in here and save the day. They're basically the, the optimal CSS way to handle these different widths and say, uh, on this big, uh, big width, we want many columns. On this small width, we want few columns, and so on. And finally, we have uh, uh, a few saves as well with dynamic content, which simply helps us to save bandwidth and maybe not uh, load all of the image sizes at the same time. So that concludes this seminar. And I'll be happy to take questions for a few minutes. I believe there is a little bit of time for that. Maybe we should pass the microphone around as well. <laughs>